you want to do? You're just gonna stand here while I do this. Yeah. All right. <sighs> Awkward. All right. Hello. Welcome to Scenario Paintball TV. Monday, May fourteenth. If you happen to be a little paintball nerd and make paintball videos, sometimes your girlfriend will break your balls. And not your paintballs. Anyway, welcome to part two of the Oklahoma D-Day interview series. I just had a, a lovely Skype conversation with Eric Engler. You're distracting me so <laughs> much. Anyway, Eric's a great guy. He lives across the lake from me when I was in America. He lives in Vermont. He makes amazing custom paintball markers. And you can check out his stuff uh, on the internet. I'll put some links down below. He's also uh, commander of the 101st Airborne Unit at Oklahoma D-Day. So he shared his perspectives and stuff with us. And um, yeah, let's play that video now before this really awkward girlfriend over the shoulder intro thing goes on any longer. Thank you. Here's the tape. Ciao. Nope, wrong one. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, that's the wrong camera. Tools! There we go. Okay. <laughs> Let's see if I can get this propped up properly here, as it were. How's that? That's good. Okay, excellent. You hear me, every, everything? Um, uh, yeah, better? hang on a second. I was getting some feedback from my dishwasher. Oh, uh, sure. Ah, okay. I think we're good. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess I I got contacted by Andy, uh, and he wanted me to do some plugging for Oklahoma D Day. That's cool. I mean, that is my favorite. That is my most favorite game, big game of the year. So. Um, I just spoke with. I spent about forty minutes talking with. Uh, one beetle. So he kind of talked about his role at Oklahoma D. I'm, I'm trying to avoid regurgitating the information on the website and trying to look at sort of the, the people and the personalities involved. So um, talk about, if you want to talk about how long you've been involved in paintball, how you got involved with Oklahoma D Day, and what do you do there? Sure. And yeah, and if you will cut, you know, if I stray or, or need, you know, you want to hit me with questions, you know, as, as we go, that's fine too. Sure. Um, sure. You know, so that way I don't, don't tread on anything, you know, that, that you already do with Juan. Um, okay? Sure. I mean, this will be my eighth year at Oklahoma. Um, I was hooked after year one, no doubt about it. it I mean, it's, I've been leading the 101st Airborne at D Day since, you know, for, for this will be eight years. And, the game's evolved. I mean, it, there there was a time where we'd go there and it was uh, a, a smaller event, and it, it's grown and gotten bigger and and more complex. You know, we would uh, run small mini games all week and then get our mission, you know, on uh, on Friday night for what we did Saturday of game week. Now our missions, you know, we we spend a year developing this game, and. Uh, and that, that's led a whole new aspect to it. We have better communications uh, at D-Day for the Allied side and for the German side than some third world countries. <laughs> so it's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, but it's, it's given it a whole new aspect. Um, you know, leading the 101st Airborne, our unit cap is 225 players. Uh, so last year we filled with a, a uh, this year we'll probably do about the same, but we had up to 250 players in the 101st year though. Wow. And to take those, uh, those players who hardly ever play with one another uh, and coalesce them into a fighting unit uh, has been a challenge, but it's great now because my unit commanders do it all themselves. I hardly ever have to teach them or, or, t or remind them you know, how to train their players. Um, they my XO has got 12 years of experience with D-Day. Um, my unit commanders are anywhere between four and eight years of experience. 
and they train their uh, their people as well, and that that helps a lot. Um, so I just ask, tell them what what they need to do, and and they go do it. And that it's it's gotten so nice. Like we've been at this level for about four years now. So all I have to do is just make sure that they uh, that they're doing the job and whatever's new. Last year, our new thing for the 101st was anti-tank weapons. We had never really concentrated on anti-tank, and uh, last year we, we hit it with uh, with our allotted amount of guns, and our guys, uh, you know, trained with their anti-tank weapon, and that was the only thing they used all week long around game day, and it made them very, uh, very effective, but it also uh, it was kind of fun to, to watch them evolve. We did training sessions during the week against tanks, and... Uh, we did a whole bunch of air ball sessions, and then I did, they were getting lax. And you know how players are; they'll get they'll get cocky. And then I picked up my radio and told the tank to go live with paint and shut everybody up. And my players were mad at me for probably two or three days. And <laughs> they just got, you know, it, it was one of those things where we we try to to be the best on the field. There's rivalries and things like that too, where we're, we have rivalries against the other airborne units and the British Commonwealth and all that. It's all fun and 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 uh, and, uh, and good, just good fun. And uh, but we try to be the best. How is that determined for the side? Are the units scored or the units aren't scored? We we have objectives that we have to do. We have uh, you know we. We have uh, points to take or areas of the field to take, but you know we also try to play every mini game. The Commonwealth does the same. It's funny because we'll have lowered German turnout, and one of the Commonwealth units or the 101st Airborne will switch sides, so that's playing against each other during the week, and that can be interesting too. Uh, but it, it's like I said, it's all paintball. It's all good fun, and uh, and how we can you know make it work and uh, and just have a good time playing it. You said you have about 200, 250 slots for the for your unit. Do you see a lot of unit loyalty, like players signing up again? And does that, to what yeah. extent, does that limit the ability for new people to get in on a unit? We always have room for new people because because we get about fifty percent. Um, this year we're about fifty percent uh, uh, return players. Uh, we've been as high as seventy five. But we always seem to never turn anybody away, which is really cool. Um, we get a lot of swap out. We've had commanders not be able to make it this year. I think I had 10% people that purchased tickets, and now they can't come. Oh, wow. oh, so they're online trying to uh, sell their tickets because they something came up, family matters or something like that, or the economy, and uh, and now they can't make the game. So, but but we we have a. We've never really turned anybody away that wanted to play, uh, but we have a we have a very high uh, physical unit, so so you have to be in really good shape to play with the hundred and first. Um, simply because uh, we we can travel. Well, I'll give you an example. We traveled two years ago uh, from the north end of the field at Breakport Manor. Uh, by noon, we were at the south of the field with. Uh, at Khan, attacking Khan in the end of the day. So, you know, we, we traveled the whole length of James Field. How um, long is that? Uh, I'm trying to think. It uh, Our march took us 35, 40 minutes from one to the end of the field to the other, and we had to, and it was hot, so we had to stop for a break. Actually, we, we ate lunch and took showers because we were just so white. I, I vowed after that that it, we did it. It was cool. No other unit had ever done it before. I don't ever want to do it again. <laughs> Once is enough. Uh, yeah, and we only lost 10 players during the march, so it was cool. And we did it in style. We did it in column, singing. <laughs> <laughs> um, the 101st, we have we have four different uh, divisions in the 101st. Two of them are fairly military-style units. One is really hardcore uh, military base. The second one, that's the 327th. Um, the 506, not so much. The 401st is very interesting. They run under the banner of Sonny the Cuckoo Puff Bird. Um, and they're just they're just crazy. I mean that that's their eagle and it's they play hard, but they're very relaxed and they love a good practical joke and they just they just they they they're they're, they're, they're gamesters. Um, they're jokers. So that so we have a unit for, for the that 
kind of casual player as well. And then we have the 502nd, and I call them my Jed Birds. They're, they're similar to a Pathfinder unit, but in respect that I can send it anywhere before game on, and they'll, uh, they'll go do it. Um, they've been, uh, two years ago, they uh, went and uh, hand grenaded a bunch of German generals at game on. <laughs> Left them, you know, holstered their markers and went out and said, oh, hi, you're the German general, and pulled up the grenade and said, goodbye. <laughs> So, uh, so that's a lot of fun. They, 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 they're a, a nice behind the, behind the, uh, the lines unit. What? I'm curious because I know you live in Vermont. What inspired you to go out to Oklahoma D.J.? His name was Andy Vanderplatz. <laughs> okay, all right. He's the force. Okay. Yeah, he's the force, all right. Um, you know, he said, you got to go do this game. You got to go meet Dwayne. Um, it's a cool game and go. And so I went and I was living in Connecticut at the time, flew out and just played. And I was just going to go out there. It's funny because I went out there and I was just going to be a, a sergeant in one of the units. And that year our CO didn't show up. Family emergency came up and the Andy had already talked to our commanding general at the time, you know, and told him I was coming. And he turned around and said, well, guess what you're going to do? <laughs> I'm like, but and I was just going out to play and have a good time. And so all of a sudden, I'm leaving the unit, and uh, and we won that year, and it was it was a great thing. But uh, it was when I got out there, um, the first thing I noticed was one of our lieutenants is trying to march the 101st Airborne around in, in a parade in parade and uh, at about 95 degrees, and that was the first thing that I killed because he was going to kill our guys trying to march them around the field. <laughs> But uh, but it's evolved. I mean, it's it's a it's an integral unit, and I couldn't do it without my XO and my unit commanders or even the players. They're the most serious group of paintball players really that, that I've ever come across. Um, not, that's the only field in the world I know that people are ready to play paintball at seven o'clock in the morning all week long. <laughs> get out of bed and get prepared and get ready to go. Yeah, they're, I mean, Friday night before the game, they're ready to go. I mean, guns are aired up, they're chronoed. If I called them at 4 o'clock in the morning and said, and put, and asked them to form up and walk out on the field, they would. Um, we actually did that, I think it was four years ago. Um, Dwayne was having some, a few issues with his buses and stuff, and I said, well, that's okay, we'll walk out. And we formed up before game on, and we were in our positions. Granted, I wanted to use it as a, as a recon of the German defenses on the way out, and we did, and, and the Germans weren't exactly happy about that, but, uh, but we got permission and we did it. How does it typically work with the airborne units? Are you usually trucked out and thrown out of a bus at intervals, or what? Because we're so, we, we get real... The 101st gets trucked out, um, it's always on Deuce and a house because the places they like to drop us, no bus can get there. No bus can get there. Uh, there's just no way you're going to take a school bus. So they just Deuce and a house and truck us out into uh, and, Tra and Northern Train where Breakwater Manor normally is, um, is up in the, uh, uh, basically the northeast of the field. But there's always rumor, and once in a while, Dwayne will do that. Well, he'll take two or three buses and, and misdrop us. And he'll throw us all over the field or in places of the field. But he's kind of learned that since we can move, those misdrop players can move before game on, they end up forming up with us well before the game starts, and it doesn't matter. How, Every, how, how early do they get dropped yeah. before game on? Uh, we'll be getting trucked out, and a deuce and a half will stop. And they'll unload 15, 20 people and say, okay, you guys are going to, you have to get from here to wherever you plan on starting by, uh, by game on. And uh, it, because my players know the field so well and we train all week long, it's never stopped. It's never been one of those things where it slowed us down at all. Sometimes it even works in as an advantage because we get to see pieces of the field and, uh, and, and, uh, and get some recon. Uh, can they engage the Germans? Since the game hasn't started yet, no. But if if the game had started or they don't get to where they're supposed to be in time, yes. Okay. Okay. Once game a game uh, once the game starts at D Day, you can you can you know 
go to your nearest dead zone and and uh, and start the game from wherever you are. Can the because are the Germans already deployed at that point? They try to get some deployed. A lot of the Germans walk out, so it all depends on how motivated they are that year. Okay. Uh, there have been years where I haven't seen a German till half an hour after game on, and there have been years where I've seen them um, and and spies and things like that. You know, an hour before game on. How is the elements of spying at this game? You know, in the Northeast we have. Well, we don't do the, the spy, as it were, where people change armbands or sides. We It's more like recon units where okay. you'll have somebody, you know, in the trees with a radio monitoring our movement. Sure. And the 101st, I, I've learned that the 101st, no matter where we go, everybody's watching. So we don't hide. We, we learned years ago not to even try to try to keep our movement secret. Um, it just doesn't work. <laughs> Um, what advice do you have for, for new people heading out there? Hydrate. Water, 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 water. This Start is a recurrent theme. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, you know what? I've seen way too many players get hurt themselves out there because they think they can handle heat. I don't care if you're from Florida, Arizona, Texas, or whatever. Most of the time, you're sitting in air conditioning anyway. Um, I've, I started hydrating a month ago. Um, because I, I mean, I, I will gain six pounds of water weight between now and the game. I will come home eight to 15 pounds lighter for a week of play at Oklahoma. Um, I've, I've, you know, dehydrated myself out there. I've, you know, so, so that's, that's the thing. If you want to be combat effective at the end of the day on Saturday and then get to work on Monday, <laughs> you need to... You need to, one, pace yourself while you're out there, but also just be ready for the game. And because the 101st is such a mobile unit, you know, we, we put on a lot of miles. Um, the other thing is, you know, for new players coming out, don't play by yourself and meet your units, meet your buddies, make friends. Everybody that comes to Oklahoma we're all friends. We're all paintball fraternity, and it's funny because even with the 101st and other units, we all make friends. We all connect and stay connected online all year long, and uh, we'll we'll go to games and we'll meet. Um, the uh, the 506 this year. It's kind of funny. They they're most of them are from Iowa, and they've played at games throughout the year. They just get together and they go play. Uh, as the same unit. As the same unit. Yep. That's great. That's great. Um, so that's a, that's a lot of fun. But again, for for the new player, come out. It's a great time. It may look a little daunting on the schedule and and on the forums. It's not. Um, just come on out, hook up with your unit, and you know, don't be afraid to ask questions. And the, the average player will have a great time. What day do you usually arrive? I'll get there on Sunday night, set up my shop, and uh, and start getting my unit together. You know, Monday morning. Do you have a, a hard shop there like a, a similar to your EMR similar to EMR what we do is we we do a I rent a 30 by 30 foot tent and we set up and show our custom guns and uh, and sell kitman equipment and this year will probably be V force as well um, but we we set up our a, a small shop we don't do a lot of teching there we don't bring a lot of customs pre-made simply because we never have the time to do it um, but we, uh, we take orders and things like that and, and have a shop so you bring the trailer all the way down there? Um, we th we have um, the last two years. I've sent every I've put everything on a pallet and shipped it and flown. Because otherwise, it's twenty four hours straight driving either way. And yeah, and so we'll. I mean, there was one year we put seventeen of us in a thirty five foot motorhome, wow. and with a trailer behind it, and drove out there. It was the most dangerous thing I ever did. <laughs> um, and you know, vowed that we'd never do that again. But anyway, so it's. Uh, you know, now now we fly, and simply because it it we'll get there, we're rested when we get there, and we get home two days sooner. Where should people fly to? Um, Tulsa is great. Uh, Kansas City works, and there's a Western Airport in Arkansas that's about an hour and twenty minutes from the field. The place that they shouldn't fly in, uh, in my experience, is Joplin, Missouri. 
Do not do fly not. to Joplin, Missouri. Okay. Everybody okay. I know that flies in Joplin, if there's weather anywhere, they get delayed. I had one team pub crawling from the East Coast uh, probably about five years ago came out to support me. And they flew out on Wednesday, and they got there Saturday morning. Wow. What? Yeah, so they got there just in time for game day. Yeah, it's crazy. The weather can be bad in Oklahoma, so, you know, you, you got to plan for that. Have you been working on any custom pieces for players for this game? Uh, yeah, actually a couple. We've made uh, what's uh, some M1 Grands. We've got some uh, uh, STG 44s of Schrungewehr. Uh, that the Germans have picked up. Um, you're going to see a couple MG42s out there on the German side this year. And there's a triple tank mounted gun that's out there that, that I'm kind of proud of. That, uh, I think uh, I saw the video on Facebook. Yeah, Alex Huron, he's, he, he's really cool. This will be his second D-Day. And he ordered a custom gun from me last year and had a fun playing with it. And his dad came out and they decided, you know what, this year we want to run a tank. How can we make a tank that fits the rules that nobody has seen before? Make a tank gun, and so he calls me up and says, "Well, what do we? What, you know, we brainstorm and said, well, why not? Two, we can have two anti personnel and one anti tank gun. Well, why don't we put a 50 cal in the middle and two 30 cal's on either side of your turret, and make them fire off of separate switches so the two anti personnel guns are off a standard 50 cal butterfly, and then the anti tank." Is, is off a button on the top under a little protective cover. So they can, so they can, oh, it meets all the D-Day rules, but the thing is a monster. Do you have anything to hand you could show? I don't know, for, for people watching this, um, Eric makes custom markers. You can maybe yeah, explain it. Here in the shop, um, like I said, we were, we were at a game last weekend. Let me see what I can find here. Okay. Um, couple interesting things here, see if I can get it on the video. This is our minimalist phenom. This is what I run with now. It's a three pound Pittman phenom. Um, basically what I did was took the phenom and cut away everything that wasn't the marker inside and, uh, and I run with it. That's my personal marker right now. Um, I've got a guy named Lee Huff. He's uh, been in my shop and been to D-Day. This will be his first D-Day, but he wanted something custom to play with. So I made him a Springfield 1903 A3. It's almost done. Wow. It's bolt action. So let's see if I can zoom in here. Yeah. But the bolt cocks, then goes back and forth. It's a straight pull bolt, but it's basically a, it's a, it's a phantom pump marker inside a 1903 A3 stock. That's beautiful. It's got a 23 inch, 23 inch stiffy in it with a six inch barrel extension. If someone wanted to pick something up like that, how much would they be, how much would they be looking at? At this, they're looking at about $900. 900. Um, but it's all real parts. So you use all real parts, right? No plastic molding or anything. No plastic, no nothing. It's, even the feed neck on here is a, a Python aluminum feed neck. If people want to see your stuff, where do they go? Uh, www.anglerpaintball.com uh, Alright, I'll put a link to that below the video. Cool, thank you. Yeah, it's actually anglerpaintballguns.com, sorry. Okay. Uh, but uh, I've had that website for 10 years, I don't know why. So what do you guys make at Angler Paintball? <laughs> okay, well we make uh, AK-47's big uh, 1919 uh, heavy weapons, uh, Browning M2 machine gun, um, we're actually taking Titman's uh, new rental marker that looks like an Uzi submachine gun and actually putting a, a real metal stock on it. I've seen uh, the I've seen the campaign by Titman. I haven't seen your mod yet. Uh, it's on our website. It's actually available for pre-order. It will ship in July. Okay. Uh, okay. The minute I saw it, and uh, I, I knew I had to make one. Uh, that might kinda... be one of the only ways to get that because that marker specifically for. Uh, room has it. <laughs> it will be available retail about July. Okay. But that's what little birds say. Okay. Because it's getting great interest, and we we actually played with the prototype last weekend, and it was it's a great marker. Yep. And it's so easy to clean and fix and, and work on, and we played with it, and it, it, we played with it for for two events in a row now, and it's it's bulletproof. Great. Uh, 
So we're making that. We're making the M3 grease gun for, for World War II buffs. Again, the, the M1 Grand. Um, I'm thinking about going back and making M1 carbines again out of the Kipling crossover. So uh, that should fit in, into, into that stock where we used to put the ion. So I'm thinking about using the crossover in that. Um, so that's what we make, custom guns. And if somebody wants something special, um, we'll make it. We started making our ACRs because nobody made one and somebody wanted one. So if you want something special, I'll make anything. And they can get in touch with you via your website. Correct. Uh, it's information at anglerpaintballguns.com, um, but right through our website as well. Okay. okay. Great. All right. Well, it's about half an hour. Eric, thank you, as always. It's great. It's great to talk to you again, and uh, I look forward to seeing all the players on the field. Um, that's where we all have a good time, and uh, hope to see you out there. Yeah, not on the side of the road after West Point. <laughs> <laughs> never, never again. That was uh, that's a story we'll, that will never uh, go away. <laughs> all right. Well, you have a good day, and um, yeah, talk to you soon. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye.